all the rotor, the field windings, because it is supplied, as you had seen from the animation, with a DC um, field, and that uh, produces a magnet with two poles, or in the case of that animation, four poles, right? So the field is in the rotor, and the stator now contains the armature windings, right? So you would take off the power, which are these uh, windings here, in the form of three phase. You would have three stator windings that are 120 degrees apart from each other. And the field is supplied from a DC source that you have uh, externally to um, the, um, the machine itself. It is usually supplied through slip rings, but we will see some certain variations in the same. So what you see on the machine is you have a three-phase supply that is, as we have gotten used to, uh, throughout all sorts of uh, mains or three-phase. It is just a normal three-phase supply, bearing in mind the fact that the windings have been placed 120 degrees apart from each other. Okay. So um, just to do another uh, demonstration of that, you would find that generally the windings have a short cylindrical uh, uh, base and you would have salient poles. That is, they are not a cylindrical rotor, it is salient poles. Each of these represents a pole uh, that is uh, providing magnetic field to the machine, right? And what you see here now, this is the uh, exciter, that is the field windings that are supplied to the machine. Straight away, you notice that the windings themselves are very small compared to the rest of the machine. So what you're doing is you're supplying a small uh, current or a small field, and it is able to generate a larger field um, that is there. Okay. So in some of these cases, what you will end up seeing is you need a different kind of exciter whereby you would want to have a way in which you avoid having a DC source. Because generally in a power plant, you would already be having the three-phase power. Uh, if these things are connected parallel to each other, these uh, generators or alternators are connected next to each other, you would uh, probably have AC sources around uh, or nearby, so you would be able to supply them. So we are next going to look at the exciter. One of the other things that we've seen uh, is that the frequency of the field supplied will be given by the speed of the mechanical movement times the number of poles over 120. Excuse me. So the frequency itself is only proportional to the speed of the prime mover and to the number of poles. So in the case of uh, a machine like this, you have a large number of poles, sorry, you have a large number of poles that are um, all over the machine itself. That means that such a machine would be able to be rotated at a very slow speed while still being able to create uh, the frequency that we'd require, which is, of course, generally 50 hertz uh, as per the Kenyan standards. So now let's look a bit at the um, excitation. So field excitation. So what this uh, diagram now represents is the schematic or the circuit diagrams of uh, the field excitation. So on the upper part of the diagram, these sections, you have the rotor. These are all circuits that are uh, mounted on the rotor. And below, you have circuits that are mounted on the stator side. The circuits that are on the rotor rotate with it. So you have the field, the rectifier, the exciter, armature. These all rotate together with the movement of the uh, windings themselves. And you have these, the stator, which are fixed onto the stator, so there's no rotation. They do not move, they are stationary. So you have two of them. You have a field input, 
and you have the ma main armature, which is the actual output of the three-phase power that you're talking about. Okay, so the main machine itself is, first of all, this section. This is the main operating part of the machine. You have your field winding, which acts as your magnet that is rotating inside uh, the stator. So through the act of electromagnetic induction, through the principle of electromagnetic induction, that movement of the magnet cutting across the armature windings creates uh, a magnet, or rather an electrical uh, voltage. And if you connect a load to it, it will also create um, an electrical current that will flow through the circuits uh, as an output. Okay. Now you want your magnet here. So how do you uh, create your magnet. You supply IF, which is a DC current. How do you get a DC current? That is what this circuit is for. So you have a rectifier connected to a small three-phase circuit, which has an AC current. Okay. On this side, it is AC, it is rectified, it becomes a DC that flows as IF, this is the field current, that flows through uh, the field windings and will be able to give you uh, an interaction with the armature windings so that you have an output. So these windings, if we relate it to the uh, photo that we've seen on this side, these windings are now uh, these windings are now uh, the ones that are here. So these are the field uh, windings. And the exciter here is the rest of this uh, the rest of this circuit that you're seeing on this part, right? So the main field windings are the many poles um, that you saw in the diagram, and the exciter is mounted on the same shaft as the rotor. So the rectifier and the smaller windings that are supplied are mounted on there. Now, at the same time, how do you get your AC current onto the rotor itself? You have a number of options. You can have, uh, on the stator side, you have a three-phase current that in turn uh, magnetizes another exciter field that passes on uh, to the um, armature through uh, either slip, uh, not slip rings, through uh, transformer action, right? So you have your DC here, but because it is uh, interacting with uh, windings that are mounted on a rotor and that are rotating, you have this one inducing a current in this field, okay? So there's an interaction between uh, the exciter field and the exciter armature, and then the exciter armature is rectified to give you the main field. So it is a sequence of input of three-phase AC, rectified to DC again, or for the first time. DC induces an AC within the armature, so you're going from DC to AC through transformer action. Then AC is rectified back. It becomes the main field uh, winding or main field current. And then that in turn interacts with uh, the main armature. Okay, then you have your output on that side. Right? If you want to make them fully independent because you still have, you know, you, you would have a three phase input that you're putting into your entire machine. If you want it to be fully independent, that is to be self-starting, you can add an extra element whereby you have this section called the pilot exciter that you add to your, um, your exciter field, right? So instead of your exciter field being connected to three-phase power, you could have small permanent magnets, which in turn, so you have like the action of a generator here, creating a three phase AC, then it is a DC, then it becomes through transformer action, another AC here, then DC and back again to um, your main armature. And finally you have your full output. Okay, so in that way, it is almost like amplifying. You're building up your currents and your voltages so that they in turn uh, create an output as you are uh, 
um, as you require. Remember, the rotor is all of this. Sorry. The rotor has, it is always in motion. Yeah, it is always rotating. And the stator is always stationary. So the interaction between these parts um, is what now indicates or gives you your uh, operation of motor or operation of a uh, generator. Any questions so far on that? Any technical challenges? Are we seeing everything? Are we hearing everything? Yes. Okay. Excuse me, I have yes. a question. Uh, what's the reason for having the permanent magnet for the pilot exciter field and not just have it at the exciter field? Um, it is kind of like amplifying. Um, generally, you, you would not have magnets that are powerful enough to provide a current that is needed. So it's almost as if you're, it is, it is like a two-stage generator, if I can call it that, yeah? Um, so the, the, each stage builds onto the next stage, get it? So at this, at the, the first stage, uh, at this stage here where you have your permanent magnets, the permanent magnets, uh, by their action with uh, interaction with the exciter armature, can generate a small current that is then pushed through. And at each stage, because you're inputting the rotating energy, at each interaction between, let me use a different, at each interaction between, you know, every time you're crossing between uh, stationary and uh, uh, rotational you are adding almost like you're adding the energy input of the rotation uh, of the prime mover into that and that becomes your amplifier you're converting the rotational motion into electrical energy okay okay, okay. thank you all right okay so um next let's look at the uh, principles of operation of uh, the synchronous generator. Now, so when you have your um, field that is rotating inside the armature, it generates uh, an electrical voltage. So how does that uh, relate to the principles or the construction of the machine? So what you will find is you have uh, an internal generated voltage, which is what we had, uh, just go back here, which is what we have here, this in the, uh, not in the armature, sorry, yeah, in the armature, you have an internal voltage that is generated. This output that I'm talking about is actually a voltage, which we call terminal voltage, right? That is your useful voltage that you can actually take off and you can have a current in the armature that you can now make use of outside of the alternator. However, within the armature itself, when you have your conversion from rotational mechanical energy through the action of the induction, Faraday's induction um, principle, you have an internal generated voltage, which we call E uh, in the armature, which depends on a number of factors. So it is given by K pi omega. So your internal generated voltage, which is that, depends on, first of all, the flux, okay? That is the magnetic field that is coming from your field windings, all right? So we've talked about here that you have an interaction between the two of them. So this DC current that is flowing here, this field current that is flowing here, uh, creates a magnetic field which has a flux called phi. Yeah, it's called phi. So that magnetic field that is here, the magnitude of that field 
determines the amount of or the magnitude of the voltage that you will get. Let me just uh, clearly. So this is in internal generated voltage. It is dependent on flux or magnetic field. At the same time, it is also dependent on the speed. We talked of uh, what is the speed of rotation and that one is what determines your uh, energy that passes across or rather your voltage that is put across. So the speed of rotation uh, via the prime mover, which we indicated previously, it's related to the frequency, which depends on also the number of poles that you have and the number, the, the speed of rotation of the, the, the actual prime mover. And the final factor that we would need to look at is here what we are calling K. So these are construction, construction factors. These are a number of them. So now that these ones are um, a way of indicating the construction of the generator that we have. So like in the photo that I showed, you have a large diameter armature, uh, field winding, which has a short uh, length. Yeah, If you had a longer length and maybe a smaller diameter, that one has a different impact on the way the internal generated voltage uh, or the magnitude uh, of the internal generated voltage that you have. So some of these construction factors are the pitch. When we talk of pitch is how far apart are the windings? What is the step from one winding to the next? What is the distance in between? You also have KB, uh, which is distribution. A distribution factor. How closely packed are these uh, windings? You know, are they, what is the nature of their distribution along the surface of the uh, rotor? And then you also have KF, which is the form factor of the windings. Are they square? Are they round? Uh, what is the shape of the coils that are there? And finally, you can also have T, which is the number of coils that you have, right? So these are now the main determining factors that will um, let us know what is the magnitude of the internal generated voltage. By far, the biggest factors are this flux and the speed of rotation. The construction factors tend to alter, I can say, the shape of the waveform. Yeah, how regular or irregular it is. But generally, the biggest factors are the magnetic field. And the magnetic field, once again, is determined by uh, the field current, IF, right? So that is a direct way in which you can alter uh, the generated voltage, right? And because of this, you can have a characteristic whereby and draw a straight line characteristic whereby if you compare the magnitude of the flux and the magnitude of the field winding the relationship between the two is generally linear up until the point you get saturation of course right so by and large if you have uh, the field current Is being varied, you can alter the magnitude of the flux that is available within uh, the space of the machine. So within the field winding. Okay. I think that is clear. So next we can move on to 
And having known that the internal generated voltage is determined by that, what are the actual parameters of the machine? So like what is the equivalent circuit of the synchronous generator? So here we have, once again, a cross-section of the uh, synchronous generator, simplified as we had done initially in the past. So you have your stator and you have your uh, rotor simplified to two poles, and it is rotating at a speed of omega m, okay? And because of that, it has a flux um, that has a value of Br, that is the magnetic field within um, the rotor. Okay, and then you have your internal generated voltage. But before we get to that, right, we need to look at, remember we've said we have two different things that we are looking at. I mentioned when we are looking at our, when we are looking at the output of our generator, what the load sees is a phase voltage that is a terminal voltage that is available at the three or the four in the case of a star connected machine terminals of our alternator what voltage does the load see we are giving it as terminal voltage v5 but we've mentioned that the internal generated voltage is given by e a now what actually happens during the operation is that your internal, sorry, your internal generated voltage will not be equal to the terminal voltage. There is a difference between the two of them. So your internal generated voltage will never be equal to your terminal Voltage. voltage okay internal generated voltage what the windings in the armature are seeing terminal voltage what your potential load and output is seeing okay so why is this the case there are four factors um, that determine that number one is the shape of the poles Okay, remember we mentioned when we are talking about the internal um, generated voltage, we've talked of the distribution, the pitch, the form factor, and so on and so forth. So those have an impact on uh, the, how the voltage, how the terminal voltage will, pass, will be passed on to um, the load. Uh, this is either you have salient poles or you have cylindrical Poles. In most uh, generators, in most practical applications of generators, you will tend to have salient poles. That is the ones that stick out, which you saw in the video, which you saw also in the photo. Let me just show the photo again. So these are the uh, sorry, these are the salient poles that we are talking about. Right, each pole sticks out. Uh, from the cylinder of the thing. They are not distributed along um, the rotor itself, right? For purposes of uh, the discussion we are having, we will assume that all our generators in these calculations that we are doing have salient poles and we will disregard the factor of uh, cylindrical poles. Those who want to go a bit deeper, there's, um, uh, I think there's an appendix I added in the text uh, or the appendix in the textbook that I added in the uh, Google Drive or the uh, class drive. Uh, you can see that, but it is not, it is really beyond the scope of what we're talking about here. So that's reason number one, why there's a difference between the two. Number two, uh, which is by far the biggest impact, you have amateur reaction. Okay, and we will describe amateur reaction shortly. Number three, you have resistance of uh, amateur coils. Yeah, remember you have your internal generated voltage coming across from 
uh, the stator or from the rotor to the stator. The field is inducing some voltage within the windings of the armature, within the windings of the stator. Uh, those windings are not uh, perfect. They have a resistance in themselves. You know, all copper, all aluminum, whatever windings you're using will have a resistance. So that has an impact. There's a voltage drop between the internal generated voltage that you find and what is available at the terminal voltage. And finally, you also have self-inductance of the armature coils. So similarly, these two together, uh, this is the impedance of the windings. In the stata. Okay, so any equation between the two of them will have to factor in the impedance of the windings as well as the armature reaction. Uh, shape of poles, we have said we will assume salient, so that will not really come into play in our discussions as uh, we look at the uh, equivalent circuit. So let's look at the armature reaction. The armature reaction has the biggest impact on the difference between the two. So let's have a look at it, all right? So here is our um, cross-section of our motor. Now let's assume the motor is running, um, the field winding is rotating within the space of the stator. So you have your rotor moving in this direction as per uh, what you have. If you have your rotor moving in this direction with the magnetic field in the direction shown, which is that way, you will then have induced voltages in the directions that are shown. So if we assume these are uh, coils or windings within the stator or within the armature, the, any current that would flow would flow out of the screen in this section and would flow into the screen in these sections that are there in the lower half because of the action of the rotor. We went through this when we were looking at uh, the principle of operation of a rotating magnetic field. It is the same thing that we have here. A rotating mag magnetic field cutting across conductors, as simple as that, all right? So what you have now is you have a rotating magnetic field that is interacting with the stator. So that field is given by BR. It is in this direction and it has a certain magnitude, right? Now, because of the action of this magnetic field, we have now created an internal generated voltage within these windings and we call it EA, which has a peak of EA max, right? So those two, because of the interaction of the field with the uh, conductors, the stationary conductors, create now uh, your um, internal magnetic or other internal generated voltage. So what happens next? Let's add a load. What happens when you add a load? When you add a load, you then have an internal uh, current that is induced in the stator that has, you know, um, a certain flow. So let's call it IA, okay? It has a flow um, within the windings. So in addition to the voltage, you now have, when you have a load, you have a current that is flowing through the windings, right? Now, this current, uh, depending on what the load is, let's assume we are running a bunch of motors. Let's say this is a lagging uh, current that is flowing, okay? What you will find is your current IA, remember this is a rotating uh, magnetic field. Because you have your current IA, you will then have, in turn, your IA will also start creating magnetic fields within because of the action of a current flowing inside a conductor. A current flowing inside a conductor sets up a magnetic field around it, yeah? Uh, for purposes of this diagram, direction will be something like that, okay? The net result of that is that you will have eventually uh, another um, magnetic field that will 
sorry, a magnetic field, let me draw it this way, that will have a resultant, say, in that direction, okay? Right, so let's say it's moving in that direction. And this magnetic field has been created by IA because IA in itself has created, a, a, has a, there's a current that's flowing through the conductors and therefore there's a magnetic field that interacts with this uh, magnetic field that is already there. So this one now is another magnetic field B, but it is because of the stator, right? The armature windings, the current that is flowing through the armature windings creates a magnetic field that is there. Now, what happened when we had a magnetic field within the, the, the rotor initially? It came with its own internal generated voltage. The same thing happens here. Yeah, You will now have a voltage that is created, but this is now an amateur reaction voltage, and it is an, a voltage because of the stator, right? So E stator, we call the amateur reaction voltage. Okay. Remember, this is due to a lagging current because of the load that has been connected. It is drawing a current. There's a difference between those uh, the current that is flowing and the uh, voltage that created it. So now you have um, another field that is created, another magnetic field. So in the end, you now have in this same space, you have your BR and you have your BS together within the same space. What then happens is you end up with a net field here, depending on the magnitude of the amateur reaction, a net field, which is the resultant of this. Okay, I've not drawn it to scale. Let's uh, call it that. But, you know, if you were to superimpose the net uh, effect of that, if you add BS to here, the resultant is B net. Uh, sorry, the scale was not very good. Let me try and retroactively end that. Okay, so let's say BS is that size. And Okay, so our BS is here. And when it is, you find the resultant of the two BR and BS, you have a net B uh, or magnetic field that is distorted. Yeah, so you have a distorted field from what you originally had from the rotor that gives you B net. And what you find is that this B net comes with your own final voltage, which is V uh, phi which is the ultimate terminal terminal voltage voltage okay and that is the gap between the two now in addition to bs of course your current ia was generating the amateur reaction voltage it is creating your amateur reaction voltage in the form of the magnetic field that is there. Remember that your IA is flowing through the armature coils. So you then have the interaction of the resistance and the self-inductance. So what we now end up with is you have all the components that are necessary, all the components that form part of the circuit of your um, the internal operations of your electrical machine or the synchronous um, generator. Okay. Any question on that? Are we getting how the amateur reaction distorts the field? Okay. So what will eventually happen is you have um, you have a E start, the voltage here can be represented by 
an X, a certain inductance due to the armature reaction. All right, we represent it by an X there times the current IA, right? Because it interacts, it is due to IA and it interacts with the, other, the others. So when you put it as in terms of a voltage, you create this element that will be able to put it into the form of a voltage. So now you have your voltage V phi, which is given by EA plus E start, right? Because you have, remember that the V phi is the resultant of the net uh, magnetic field, which is the initial magnetic field that you had plus the amateur reaction voltage, uh, or rather the, the field due to the armature reaction, right? So this then becomes EA minus J X I A, okay? So if we want to now also include the, uh, the impact of the resistance and the self-inductance of the coils, you then have an additional one. So this element is due to amateur reaction. It is the representation of amateur reaction. You will also have to now subtract again um, a value J X A I A, where X A is the uh, self inductance that we talked about of the amateur coils. And in addition to that, you will also have to subtract X, uh, not X, this is R, which is the resistance, R A times the current that you're flowing through the armature, which is the resistance of the windings. So having put all of that together, we are now in a position to indicate what is the actual representation of the internal generated uh, voltage. So we have it as, if we take it to the other side and have your terminal voltage on this side, it can be V5 plus J times XIA plus J times XA IA plus again, sorry, there's no J there. That is a uh, resistance. It is not a, it's a real element, not a reactive element. So R A I I, A, right? So now you then have all the components that you would need to create an equivalent circuit of your alternator or your um, synchronous generator. Now for convenience, we tend to combine these two inductive elements whereby we give them a value called the synchronous reactants synchronous reactant, which is equal to the sum of the two. Okay, so the reactance due to amateur reaction and the reactance due to self-inductance of the uh, windings themselves, right? So your final um, equation would look like EA equals V phi plus phi plus j x s i a plus r i a or in other words v phi is equal to e a minus j x s i a minus r a i a so you have a circuit um, that looks something like this. So the equivalent circuit we can now draw um, would look like this.
So, of course, this is a three phase machine. So, this would be EA1, uh, B51, so on and so forth. So, you would have actually three of these windings. All Where you have EA1, EA2, and EA3. So you have three windings with all the elements that you are talking about, RA, RA, and you have three phases, uh, E5, 3, right? So this is the amateur side. To complete the circuit, we can indicate on the field side what are some of the elements that you have. Uh, sorry for the roughness of that. So this would be RF, the resistance of the field windings. This would be XF, uh, the inductance due to the field windings. And over here, we can have now an adjustment uh, resistance that allows us now to play around with the value of the field current. Remember we said that the amount of the internal generated voltage uh, EA is directly proportional to IF as well as the speed of rotation and of course the construction factors. So this IF is regulated using that resistance that you have there, right? Um, then you'll have, of course, a VF on that side. So this is essentially your equivalent circuit of the synchronous generator, okay? Um, so at the same time, let's look at a couple of uh, additional characteristics of the uh, this electrical circuit that we have here. So let's take a look at one of these elements, yeah? So that we look at uh, what do the phase diagrams look like? Let's draw the phase diagrams. This we can call the equivalent circuit. This is your very important equation. And that was your derivation. Okay, so we are all here together. Right, so the phase diagrams. Remember that we have uh, two main voltages that we're looking at. We had our EA, the internal generated voltage, and you have your uh, terminal voltage, the internal generated and the terminal voltage. So now let's take the terminal voltage to be our baseline, to be the initial, uh, sorry, my lines are not very straight. I'll try and get a better one. Okay, slightly better. So that is your terminal voltage. Let's call it V5, okay? We're assuming it is at zero degrees uh, angle, and we're assuming it is our baseline, which we will use um, to take the same. Now, if you have a load that has unity power factor, okay? So it is at the same power angle as your terminal voltage. So let's say it is just in parallel here. Let's call it IA at unity power factor, right? They are parallel to each other in the same direction. What happens to your uh, other elements? So you have your current IA, uh, let's indicate it here. So your current IA flowing through your entire circuit, uh, assuming we add a load that looks like that, right? So you have IA flowing through, you have a terminal voltage which is seen across these points, and you have your load, which we have added there, right? Internal generated voltage is our source. Now, the IA interacts with the RA, and you have a voltage drop in that point, okay? So this is IA, RA, okay? RA, or rather the resistance does not alter the direction of the current. So you have 
IARA, which is your voltage there, can be added and it will look like that, okay? So that is the potential drop due to this element RA. Potential drop due to JXS. Straight away you have your complex or your reactive element. So that means that your uh, potential or the voltage drop that you have there will be at 90 degrees because of your J, it will be at 90 degrees to your current IA. So in that case, you draw it at 90 degrees and you have J, I, A, X, S, right? So remember we said your internal generated voltage EA is equal to the sum of the terminal voltage, the combined synchronous reactance times current and the resistance times the current itself which we have indicated here, okay? So the resultant EA is actually, if I can get a straight line here, it's actually from there to there. So you have EA being the resultant of all these um, elements. You have your terminal voltage, your resistance of the windings, and your synchronous re re reactance, the combined synchronous reactance. So there will be an angle between the um, internal generated voltage and the terminal voltage, right? This is for unity power factor. Note the magnitude that we are having. Let's say now we have our load, instead of unity, it is at lagging, sorry, lagging power factor, right? Let me attempt to draw the voltage same way that is v phi and you have now because you have a lagging power factor let's say our ia now has an angle uh, to it right so they are now not parallel to each other the way the voltages uh, they initially at unity power factor they were so now there is an angle so what does that imply it means that this element and this element now have a different direction so the resistive element is in parallel to the direction of uh, the current that was there. So it looks like that in parallel to each other. Okay, let's assume that is parallel. Uh, reactive element is still at 90 degrees. So we we'll call it 90 degrees like that. Looks like that. So this is IARA and this is JIAXS, right? Let's call this IA1. IA2. This is EA1. So what you will see is, excuse me, uh, a lagging power factor leads to an internal generated voltage that looks like that, right? So EA2, right? So straight away you can see when you compare the two, the magnitude of EA2 is much more and also the angle at which it is being generated is less to compensate for the current changes that are there. So why do we take the terminal voltage as the fixed? Practically in the engineering uh, scenarios, you would want a fixed terminal voltage. If your client is expecting 415 volts, you need to give them 415 volts. And that 415 volts would be the terminal voltage, as we said, what the load actually sees, yeah? What the load will see is the terminal voltage. So you want it to be 415. So it means that if your load changes power factor, you have to vary your internal generated voltage accordingly. So if you have unity internal uh, generated vol uh, unity power factor, internal generated voltage is at this level. If you have a lagging power factor, internal generated voltage is at that level. So it means that you have to go back to your uh, machine. In order to change the internal generated voltage, you have to now change your IF. So how do you do that? This is where now we have your resistance or your methods of changing the uh, magnitude of the current that you have, okay? So that's what you have to understand. Um, similarly, with leading power factor, just for completeness, let's talk of leading 
power factor. You have your same terminal voltage, but in this case, IA3 now has a leading angle. So what does that mean? You will then have your, uh, sorry, you will then have your IA RA looking like that, IA3 RA looking like that, and your IA2 XS, sorry, IA2 XS times J, looking like that. And what that means is you now have EA3 which is actually at a much smaller, the magnitude or the length of this vector is much smaller than what we've seen. When you have a lagging power factor, you need um, more or higher voltage to produce the same terminal voltage. But when you have a leading, a load with a leading power factor, the terminal voltage to retain the same terminal voltage, you can afford to reduce the magnitude of that, however, you have to have a much greater power angle between the two, okay? So those are now uh, factors that are needed. So now what you will see is when you have a lagging power factor, you need a large um, field current. And when you have a leading power factor, you don't need as much field current as we saw um, before, okay? So that's essentially the equivalent circuit and the principles of operation of your uh, synchronous generator. Any queries so far? Okay. So what we will now do, let's uh, wind up with an example um, of what we will look at. So you have a three-phase star-connected alternator that supplies a load of 10 megawatts, right? The load is lagging at 0.85, and we want a terminal voltage of 11 kV. Calculate the line value of EMF, so the internal uh, generated voltage, which was EA, okay? That's what we are looking for. EA is what we are trying to find, okay? Right, so um, straight away, what is the output current that we have? The output current is equal to the power over root 3 times terminal voltage times power factor. Okay, or let's call it cos phi, it's cos phi, right? And that is given by 10 times 10 to power 6, which is 10 megawatts that we have here, divided by root 3 times the terminal voltage, which is 11,000 times, uh, some people still joining us, Fuller times uh, the power factor. So let's do that, 10 exponential 6 divided by root 3 times, times 11,000 times 0.85, right? So that gives us 617.5 amps roughly. So that's the current that is now um, flowing through your um, circuit, okay? Now, um, 
what is the phase value of the terminal voltage? Let's give uh, phase E phi is given by 11,000 divided by root 3, which is 6,350.85 6, volt. What is our value of um, phi itself? So phi is cos inverse of 0 0.85. So so it is 31. Point, let's say eight, 8 degrees. Okay. Right, so we are moving that along. We want EA. So EA uh, is given by EA is given by V phi plus IA RA plus JIA XS. We can combine these two so that we have V phi plus IA into RA plus JX. S. Okay. So let's try and see what that is. So EA will be given by V5. We've seen it as 6350 point eight five. This one is at an angle which we will uh, determine later on plus six hundred and seventeen point four. Oh, got up. Point five, sorry. Point five into R A is zero point one and X S is zero point six six. Okay. So now we have um, all of those together. So you have 6350.85.85 plus 617.5 times 0.1 plus 0.66i. Should give us what we want. Um, that is six four point six plus J four zero seven point five five. Let's put it into polar form. So it gives us six. Six four two five point five at an angle of uh, three eight. We went wrong somewhere. to include the angle, sorry, that angle that we calculated, 31.1.8. Okay, so actually, Actually, 5459.3 plus 3754.16 or 17. And if we change that to polar, comes, yeah. So it is, sorry, 6625.5.
0.5 at an angle of 34.5 degrees. So that is our EA. And the line value of that will be root 3 times EA, which is 6625.5, which is equal to 2 okay so that's our final internal generated voltage so in order to produce remember we want a terminal voltage of 11 kV in order to produce 11 kV you need to set your field such that the internal generated voltage is 11,475 at an angle of uh, 34.5, right? Which we saw um, at this side, let me minimize that, which we saw here at the phase diagrams at this point. So a lagging PF, yeah? So if this is 11 kV, this is now 11, 500 or whatever it is, maybe. Okay, so you have a greater uh, internal generated voltage also at an angle that is greater than what we had, right? So I think we can stop there. Um, that is our introduction to synchronous generators. Uh, next lecture, we'll look at a few other things. I will try and get the... Um, I'll try and get the recording out to you uh, within the next couple of days. Uh, so then we'll see from there. Uh, any final questions that you would want to ask? Excuse me? Yes. Why did you change your value uh, when calculating AA from 60? 4, 12 to 50 something. Which point? Why did you change your value towards the end of the example? Why did I change my value? Yes. Okay, at which point? You've uh, said? E -A. Uh huh. There, just there. Why did you change from? From? Um, you had obtained 64.12.6 and then you... Oh, ah, right. Okay, so that one, yeah, yeah. Remember, okay, let me let me even indicate it in red. Remember we said uh, the angle, so the, the, sorry, that was a mistake on my part. So you have your voltage, uh, terminal voltage looks like that. And you have your uh, internal generated that looks like that. Okay, so remember now you had um, your values that you look you added in between. So you have your IA that was uh, lagging in between, right? So that's the angle that we're including in between. So we added it here, right? We added it here. Great. So we are taking IA to be our zero degree, or no, actually. You have a point, by the way, because IA is the one that has uh, that angle. IA is the one that has this angle of 31. Okay. So EA should have its own different angle. So actually, if we do, we said IA, RA should look like that. And then so IA, RA, J. I A X S looks like that. So actually, I may have been right in the beginning because you have E A is at an angle that is unknown. However, this 6350, the voltage is taken as zero degrees. Yeah. 
because this is VFI. Okay. So actually the initial, yeah, you're right. The initial calculation I had done, let me just bring back the calculator. Excuse me. Yep. So shouldn't you add like the 31.8 degrees to the 61.617? To get the current, because the current is lagging the phase voltage. So like 617.5 angle negative 31.8 times 0 0.1 onwards. So you would add it to this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, at some point it has to come in because you're trying to get EA on this side. So the angle... So it, it would have to be at an angle of 31.8, which was there. So it's actually... So we'd say the angle needs to be added here, right? Yeah, it should be, should be negative. Negative, negative, yeah, yeah, negative, yeah. So that now on the other side it goes that way. Let's see what that gives us. So we've said sixty-three fifty at an angle of zero plus. 617.5 at an angle of, sorry, angle of negative 31.8 times. You've written one. Huh? Sorry? The angle, I think you've written 1.8. Uh, 31, huh? Okay, 31.8 times the bracket 0.1 plus 0.66i. Okay, what that gives us a half. 6618. Uh, So it is 66.25, the same, but the angle, because the angle is measured from terminal voltage. Terminal voltage is the baseline. That is where our difference is coming in. Yeah. So let's change this back to... Okay, so actually, actually that was a very good catch. Actually, you have quite the same, although the magnitude remains the same, but the angle is different. So you have 6618, let's say 1 plus J313.83 uh, volts. Now that is the value, but the angle comes ah, 2.715 degrees, okay? So actually magnitude remains the same. However, the angle that we have, because we are measuring the angle from here, actually this makes more sense because the angle wouldn't be that big. So this would be a, what's the colors? 2.7 degrees. So that actually your total angle is 34.5, which is in between the two, which is what we had before. So instead of 34.5, which was total angle that way, the only thing that changes is those 2.715, 2.715. Okay, thank you for that. That's a good catch. In fact, I should change it in my notes, meaning I taught last year's group the wrong thing but I'll change it in the notes.
2.715. Okay, any other questions? If there are no other questions, uh, we can leave it at that. Um, I think we had agreed that uh, the lectures will generally be um, this Friday morning lectures. Um, I don't know what happened with the link. Um, so maybe what we'll do, if I cannot join, uh, I'll be sending another link. Uh, thank you for moving across very quickly when we started. Um, but I hope next time uh, we will have resolved that issue. So thank you, we'll uh, leave it at that.